what is esports piece for people who don't know esports? That they love it. Hi, everybody. I, this is Lisa Dolly at the UNC School of Education. I'd really like to welcome you to a, our most recent episode in Innovations in Game Based Learning, which is uh, hosted by the Mighty Program in the UNC School of Ed. And I'm really excited um, about our topic today, which is the explosion of college esports, and our very, very special guests, um, who include Dr. Chris Haskell from Boise State University. So, welcome, Chris and also include three of the, you're all officers, correct? Uh, from the UNC eSports program. And so today we're just gonna be exploring and talking about um, the explosion of eSports. I'm gonna go off camera um, and help our bandwidth a little bit <laughs> and um, start us off with Chris today. So Chris, feel free to take over. Well, okay, I'm gonna take over. And we're gonna start, start talking about why you should never Hanzo main ever. No, actually, um, this is really cool. It's fun to actually be be here with the, the esports group because they get this. We get people in the room who get this. It's super exciting. And so actually what we'd love to do if we can is we'd like to start out with the, the question, throw this in the chat, and we'll respond to it over time. What's the one thing you're hoping to discover? Is it... Um, you know, how can you incorporate esports into what you do? Um, I, I know this one person and they're really into it. I don't understand their world. You know, whatever your question is that you probably packed with you, throw it in the chat and the group uh, here will will answer it uh, over the time. But I think it would be fun to start for those handful who don't really get what esports is to just start with a quick little video the what is esports. So if we can do that. I'd love to do that. Let me, uh, let me kick this off here. It doesn't like me, but I'm selecting it, I promise. There it is. Now it should work. This is what is esports.
That's pretty dang cool. Okay, so this idea, those of us joining in the webinar here, thank you for these questions. We're going to dig into these. It's going to be cool. Lisa's going through them now. But if you have questions at any time, throw them in. We'll get them in the discussion here. So to the crew here, um, esports is the biggest world that most people have never heard of. Just a reminder that the video game industry, $30 billion a year, North America only, is bigger than the movie industry which blows a lot of people's minds when you think about how much money is spent to create just one of a season of movies. So the question to the crew, why esports? Why is it the biggest thing that most people have never heard of? Shane, what do you got? Yeah, so there's the mic. Um, so I think we kind of talked about this last night at the dinner. Uh, you kind of brought up that with esports, you have these communities that are kind of just, uh, you have to be introduced to the community to really see it and just be pulled in by some prominent member or just any member of the community and hear about it. But if you haven't heard about it or you have no like links to this community, uh, then it just doesn't exist for you, right? But for our generation, like millennials, and even it's expanding beyond millennials at this point, um, we're just so like tightly knit through social media and like online interaction that uh, these uh, platforms like Reddit, Facebook, et cetera, just it makes getting into these communities and getting these interactions much easier. I yeah, so I mean, wh where, where are these communities actually living? What's the, sorry, where, sorry where, where, where are these actually living? I mean, where are these communities actually alive? So why, why so many people playing games now and not playing, say, field hockey? Uh, so my opinion on that and one thing that is so appealing to video games is that uh, field hockey requires some sort of athleticism or uh, physical um, ableness, I suppose. Uh, have you seen have you field, field hockey? hockey? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm not really into sports ball anyway, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, with with video games, what's cool is that a video game can allow you to fly. It can allow you to like shoot fireballs at people. It allow you to transform into anything you want, regardless of like who you are, what you can do, what you can't do. It's just about the time you put into it and how much you enjoy it that make it so appealing compared to to more traditional sports, I would say. Very cool. Okay, so here's the kind of direction I, I want to go in this. Now, we're, as we're talking about this idea of college esports, and this is to the to the folks here. I'm I'm the director of Boise State's uh, esports program. Uh, I've got a co-director in, in Dr. Brett Shelton, and we've got about 260 students right now involved in our esports, uh, really our varsity esports program, which goes from club all the way to starting uh, teams. And I came on to this really around January, right? And so this is kind of a discussion for us. There was already a, a, a group on campus. We had a U-Law uh, club, a chapter. Um, we didn't have a TESPA chapter, but we were built that TESPA chapter uh, this year. For those who are uninformed, those are two of the game uh, or entertainment company specific student groups. TESPA is part of Blizzard, which creates well, you'll remember some of these names, Warcraft, Warcraft 2, Starcraft, Starcraft 2, right, all these games, World of Warcraft, Overwatch, Hearthstone. Who says Hearthstone? Do we have any Hearthstoners? Okay. Let's not, nah, nah. friends don't let friends say Hearthstone. It's, people at Blizzard, actually, people at Blizzard, true story, they actually call it by both names. There's an internal war of who's going to win the Hearthstone versus Hearthstone. So, but the... Uh, 
these spaces, um, these these games, um, and these clubs are are part of campus. You guys have both here, right? You have a U Law Club and a TESPA chapter, correct? Te I guess technically they're both called chapters, right? Just a part of one big family, but yeah, you've got okay. Do they share officer? The yeah. same officers? Yeah, one officer. Perfect. Okay, that's yeah, that's really that's really interesting to hear because we've been discussing how we should do that and how, how that'd be interesting. Okay. But uh, but to give you just a little bit of the backstory, and I've got some I've got some video that uh, that might be might be valuable to you is when I when I uh, got involved in just kind of researching esports, I actually went back to the beginning, right? The beginning of college football. This video that we're showing is actually from 1903. We didn't have video cameras, um, not even Betamax uh, back in 1903. It was all film back in the day, and the. The first three college football teams, and Shane and I had this conversation last night, were actually schools that decided that they would play a game that the students already loved, right? Students had been playing football long before 1869 against different fraternity houses or sometimes against different schools. And it was the first three schools that decided to sanction it, to allow them to play uh, themselves as part of their school. And those schools were Princeton, Yale, and NC State. I'm totally kidding, it wasn't NC State. It was Rutgers. Sorry, just a little troll in here. And, uh, and, and they played each other. We had in 1869, technically our first college football champion. And schools would grow. This sounds an awful lot like, uh, like eSports in a sense, that, um, that schools saw what other schools were doing and says, yes, we want, we want our own varsity version of this football thing that the kids love, that the older folks, they didn't understand it. It wasn't, it wasn't hunting, it wasn't lawn bowling, and it wasn't cricket, which were the, uh, the popular uh, richer sports back in the day. But what happened over time is that many, many schools continued to do that. Now, a little bit more on that story later, but today we know that we have 884 college football teams that started with three, and, and the recognition of a student game. Esports is an awful lot like this. So I'll throw this question out uh, to, to the crew. Um, do you think I was alive in 1903, yes or no? Okay, and the second question is, um, what does it mean when a school recognizes something that is part of your living active culture? What, is it, what does it mean? Uh, yeah, so um, by having a school recognize any program, I suppose, it just kind of gives legitimacy for you because um, as a student and a student organization, the institutions are going to look at you and they're going to say, yeah, sure, you have this investment in the, in the institution and maybe your specific organization at this time and its success at this time that it benefits you, but it's really hard to sell initially that you really do have a uh, an investment in the university or the persistence of this organization at the university for the university and its future, it's really hard to sell that. And once every university realizes that and will recognize this organization, club, sport, or whatever, um, it just gives you a, a tangible ground in the university society and even like just society in general. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys have some thoughts on that? Thoughts? So you, you make an interesting point here, and we had this conversation. Um, at Boise State, we're able to use the, um, the varsity, well, the athletic logo, right? So there, at, at our university, there are two different logos. There's the Boise State B, which is the academic logo. Some, some schools have a crest or something like that. that and then they have what they des describe as the athletic logo. Not all schools follow this. Maybe sometimes they combine, but ours does. And so it's an either-or kind of situation. And for us, we were granted permission to use both, which is pretty amazing. But the first non-athletic department entity to ever be able to use the Boise State horse, right? The athletic logo. And it came at a beautiful moment in a meeting with a lot of smart people. And someone asked, yeah, but is esports really a sport? 
Now you could launch into lots of explanations of why we might consider it a sport. And let's actually talk about that. But the answer we gave was very simple and very short. And it was ESPN covers it. Long pause. Then somebody said, all right, makes sense. And that was it. That was it for us. Now, of course, I think there are a lot more definitions of why this counts as a sport and why a university would want to give credence to it, not just as a club or, or an interest. So let me ask you, is eSports a sport and, and why? Hello? Is this better? <laughs> okay. Yep, there we go. Okay. Um, so I do think that esports constitutes as a sport. <laughs> this, is just, this is a lot going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> you can just slide the one laptop yeah, back and forth. That would have probably been Jesus. better. Than Jesus! Jesus! So, um, esports does constitute as a sport because yeah, even though it, it exhausts um, an individual's mental capacity, I think, which is one of the sports requirements, I guess, also requires teamwork and um, that kinds of stuff. So I guess we've had previous struggles saying that esports uh, esports does not constitute a sport because it doesn't exert like physical, physical activity, activity yeah. or something like that. <laughs> and I think that's just not fair because there are a lot of sports like curling that are like by minimal argument are considered as um, sports, even though esports, I believe, has even more qualities that should allow it to be considered as a sport. Just um, rhetoric in general, like if you if you hold on to the meaning of a word for too long, it becomes archaic and you're just really holding on to something that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so. I think the word sports really, as it's developing in the future, it's it's as Irene said, it, it requires not just physical exertion, but like, or it doesn't require physical exertion, but mental exertion, strategy, time and dedication, teamwork, etc. I think that's really the defining features of what is what makes us. I think it was. I think it was Dr. Haskell. I think it was that it was um, Dr. over time, any yeah. word yeah. Um, naturally occurs a semantic shift. The culture grabs it and makes it what they want. Uh, 80s culture folks, words like awesome, tubular, wicked, right, um, have all been used to describe something dramatically different. And I would argue that awesome gets used more often in the semantic shifted version, as probably sports does, than in the original uh, version. So uh, that's an interesting piece. Lisa, what what thoughts, questions, what, what does our audience really want to get from us today? Okay. Hedrix is, uh, is efforting some of those answers, is, uh, is efforting some of those answers on the back end. So let's take this opportunity to yeah. find thanks. Let's months. take this opportunity to find thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. One Shane's going to do some reads yeah. right now. <laughs> Shane's going to do some reads <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, we have Alice uh, Verstrat. Sorry for the mispronunciation. Uh, so she's asked, do you feel that UNC administration has been supportive or is there a perception that students will be less successful in academics because of time gaming? So I think our people here with the uh, School of Education and the idea of gamifying gamification of things ha would have something to say. Um, but personally, I think um, there there may be some uh, misconception that gaming would really affect that uh, affect school uh, performance. But honestly, how is it any different from going to swim practice after school or? like drama or anything really. <laughs> so if someone, I haven't heard that argument brought up before. I, I've heard of it as a hypothetical, but I've never heard it specifically. 
Um, but if someone were to bring that up, I would be very confident and refuting it. <laughs> also, um, the computer science department actually has been very supportive of everything yeah. that's going on. Our um, advisor, Diane, has been rooting for us. And she also teaches some classes like serious games that incorporates gaming um, into like ge the education system, which I think is also better for us in the long run, just because um, like children, high schoolers, middle schoolers, even college students are, can sometimes be more encouraged to participate in education if they think it's fun, right? So that's where the video gaming part comes in. Well, if I can, just to add a little bit to that, well, I can just add a little bit to that. You had a role with it, just like any live broadcast. You're talking about um, that cultural piece, right? And 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 the tie-in. And I've got I've got a piece that I think would be really valuable for folks here. We may have to increase audio if we can on this system so they can hear the interview part of that. Is that possible? I can mute myself. I'll 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 bring it out through here and see see if we can do it that way. We'll we'll play with it. We'll we'll make it work somehow, some way. But there's a there's an important interview piece in here. Okay. So no, I'll I'll play it. Um but yeah, I'll give you the thumbs up when when it's time uh, for a little bit of audio there. But yeah, I see I see what you're saying. Um is it possible to mute me locally? Maybe not. Well we'll get on with this. But um and I, I think this is important. I, I find myself always um, kind of making uh, entrees to, to different communities to try and, and bring in validity and information to other people so that I can leverage smart people, right? Leverage smart people to the thing that I'm trying to des describe. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a researcher at the university, games uh, educator in, in the College of Ed. I've been heavily involved in researching esports for about a year now. And it wasn't something that I realized could happen on my campus or here, UNC, but something that eventually would happen. And, uh, and it was a message I felt very much like Frodo with the ring, right? It's like, oh my gosh, what do I do with this thing now? It's, it's way more scary than I, I thought. There's so much to it. I actually make that face. Um, but the, the research I describe when I say I, I've been researching this, is to actually reach out to dozens of high-level personalities at Riot, at Twitch, Ballistics, um, and and other endemics in the in the business to to ask. So what's going on here? What are we doing with collegiate? What's what's this? Most of them have blocked my number. Let's be honest, right? Because I call them so much. No, I'm kidding. But um, one of the places I've been able to reach out to a lot and get a lot of information from is Blizzard, right? They are the most successful game studio of the past 20 years. They're at the heart. Of video games are at the heart really of, of esports. And they created, as we've talked about, this World of Warcraft, one of the biggest and longest lasting online games uh, of all time. They make Hearthstone or Hearthstone, if you're weird, um, Overwatch, Starcraft, right? They get esports. Really, they invented it. But I, I sat down, and this is where Lisa will come in, with Adam and Tyler Rosen, who run TESPA, which is Blizzard's collegiate esports leagues and tournaments and ask them why people push back against competitive gaming. And I think Adam's answer really hits it on the head. Um, gamers are often vilified, right? Um, but Blizzard, like any institution that does extensive research into game culture, finds that actually the stereotypes just don't add up. Yeah, and that's 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 exactly what we're talking about here. It's another medium that draws people together. I think that's the brilliant part. It's not not about isolation, but uh, but about.
Yeah, and I, I think that's a, that's a critical piece. And so it's worth saying again, great universities build communities. That's what they do. And games are a part of our culture, as you would agree. And, and believe it or not, they're more popular, as we discussed, more prevalent, more relevant than, uh, than TV, music, um, and, and all the others. Yeah, and Tyler points out that uh, that gaming is not a fringe activity, right? It's it's mainstream. Sorry, hipsters, it's here, right? I anyone without a game on their smartphone or their iPad, anyone? Probably not in this room. Probably not watching either. Um, we're all gamers in one respect or another. Um, so across town at the University of California, Irvine, they recognize that if a campus has sports, if it has movies. If it has music, then it should also have gaming. And UCI, in fact, built one of the first esports arenas, um, a space where students can just come and play. And currently, <clears throat> currently, it's the largest esports arena in existence with 60 machines. But if I have my way, it won't be the biggest for very long. Let's hear just a little bit about it. Isn't that cool? This is Kathy Chong, and she's the uh, arena administrator. And so she has a lot of things to say about that space. So think about this. UCI is actually a destination for gamers, part of what their campus really is now. So the UCI arena is also open to the public. It generates revenue back to help fund the space and uh, scholarships. But as Kathy points out, creating a space for college esports is not really about a high caliber team uh, or an arena that generates millions back to uh, their fund. So it's about creating that home, and this is what I'm gonna to launch to you guys here in just a second. That community, just as important as a rec center, right? Or, or as, a, as a eating facility, it's core to that identity. So people are, are super excited about what we're doing, about the club that you're building, about what we're doing. Um, Boise State being one of those that comes in as a big school with Varsity Esports. Um, and the biggest game studios in the world, they're paying attention to what we're doing.
So it's edifying to know that we're doing the right things, that you're doing the right things uh, here to build a program that has the right perspectives. And as Adam describes them, it's the it's the academic component. It's the facilities component, community and even competitive uh, perspectives that are all critical to the success of any kind of esports program. But it's not just about wins and losses. It's not just about top ranked players. It's about what you're creating for your campus, right? As a as a place where people who love game culture can feel like they have a home. And campuses really are a home so that you can take that really big leap from where you came in to who you're gonna be in the world. So my question to y'all is, um, is what's the piece that needs the most support here um, to, to bring that to the next level? Loaded question. Uh, like, so just to clarify, the piece that we need like the most, whether like academic support or like, like yeah, administrative. Where, where, where do you, where would a lot of help right now move you to the, that next level? We'll let our treasurer take this one. He's been working on a lot of sponsors. All right. So in terms of um, what we're looking for, Hazim, by the way. Oh yeah, I'm Hazim. I'm the treasurer of esports. Um, <laughs> So in terms of actual support, like more top level administrative support. So we've been seeing this um, currently, like we receive funding from the resident resident housing association and they've given us funding to hold our viewing of the League of Legends World Finals in, can, can they hear me? Yeah, they, uh, to hold the League of Legends World Finals at our main auditorium on campus. And on top of that, that same event was also sponsored with Q, sponsored with QAB, which is our, which is a university sponsored organization. Like specifically, this is made from the university and they put university people on this board also. So this has allowed us to bring in more outside people in terms of an actual community, not just on campus, but a little bit outside of Chapel Hill and in Carver also. And um, yeah, so like these are two elements of university support that has allowed us to grow a little bit into a more like mainstream sense on campus and more university support, whether it be a space for us to, you know, club hold, space. Yeah, yeah, like uh, like club space or a space for us to hold like larger events, a PC arena, mm -hmm. you know, just like, you know, Boise State's plan and UC Irvine, like an actual space that people can come to, you know, they can have a great time and uh, something that doesn't have the stigma of this is something that like just like a very niche amount of people do, but yeah. something that's very accessible by everyone. It's yeah, it's very tangible presence on campus. Like by creating a like a club space for this kind of stuff, it uh, it definitely really uh, just makes it even more real for not only the people that already know about it, but the people who like just are interested in it, but don't know about it because the, like, the tangible presence so isn't there. Let me ask you guys space. this question. Us, please. Please. Let you me know, ask you guys this question. Um, and, and Lisa, if you want to jump in on this too, because you know, yeah, okay, well, um, I, I'll, I'll speak for the academics in the room, and there are quite a few academics, that, um, that great ideas, um, really meaningful ideas that happen on campuses, there are a lot of really, really good ones. And those that ultimately find a home are those that have space to put them first. Um, we joke all the time that we we want to build a hospital for puppies and babies at our university. And, uh, and we bring that idea forward and everybody's on board. They ask you where you're going to put it. And then you say, well, we haven't actually found a place yet. Do you know of a place? They'll say, we're not going to save any puppies or babies. Because if you don't have a home for it, it's really hard to get it. But my question to you is, and, and to those who are part of other programs and stuff like that, is there a space that could, with the right support, potentially be repurposed? If, if, the, if the, the ask to the university was, we, we know that it's really impossible for you to build us a whole new space right now, you know, because building projects are, are sometimes five to 10 years out. Is there a place where we could get partial ownership of, or that has lower numbers during, could we, you know, could uh, could our esports activities occupy that space, say, from, you know, 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. 
as opposed to during the, the classroom day. Is there, is, are there spaces potentially like that across campus? Yeah, so actually in the our student union at UNC, clubs can apply for uh, club spaces and it's, it's by semester, it's yearly or is it semester? I think it's yearly. So yeah, you, it's, it's yearly. Yeah. Um, and essentially that access, just your uh, public space that your members can come to, your officer board can come to and work uh, together and it just like provides that space. Um, and the thing about that, that though is that it doesn't really cater to an esports space. I would say, do you have something? Yeah. So um, I think you brought up a great point, and um, something that is actually in line with that right now is that there is something called student experience, which is the university's five to ten year plan on repurposing um, like the all the gyms and the student union for to include more clubs. So in terms of actually looking for a space, like right now is almost the time to start pushing university and start like asking like, maybe, you know, this part of the union that is not used by anybody, maybe this could be our space. And our union, um, the union we have here is like our central area where there's a ton of classrooms, there's a ton of meeting rooms and um, space that's just kind of people reserve, but isn't always occupied, you know, 100% of the time. I th that's a good, that's a good one. And that's a good one. That's I, a good, that's I would one. encourage you. Uh, I would encourage to find you. an underutilized um, space. So find an underutilized uh, perfection space. of that space is less important than than you you've got an opportunity to make it a home. You know there may be a, a business analytics computer lab that is was built out years ago just doesn't get used because of some other feature of the program that's now changed and and may be able to help host having faculty champion the cause, as Shannon and I spoke about last night, often will get you into doors that, that as students, that are very difficult to enter. Not because people don't want, you know, the conversation. It's just that there's so many conversations to have with students and great ideas because students are full of great ideas that it's a loud space. But faculty can be, and I'll call on the faculty in the room to acknowledge it, faculty can be wonderfully annoying. And you know, and and harass our, our colleagues enough that they're like, all, all right, you do your thing, right? That, and and so that's helpful. That's helpful. What questions, Lisa? Do we do we need to kind of bring out here? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I keep calling on Lisa, but she's frozen. You and if you can't see this, no, no, Lisa's actually frozen. And if you can't see this, Lisa's actually frozen. Not frozen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I think. Let me unmute Mike. So we have a lot of really great questions. Um, so I'm just going to rapid fire here if you guys don't mind. Okay. Oh, so. <laughs> what oh, okay. okay. Um, sure. Here's a, to start off, uh, Andrew asked, how prevalent is esports in colleges and universities across the country? We've been hearing about some really active and exciting programs, but like how Want many schools are these at? Want some numbers? Here some numbers. Sure. Right. Um, okay. um, right. Um, textbook books, um, textbook books, textbook books over 200 you all uh, reports over 400 all, schools uh, playing in their tournaments. Those are just two game companies, and and, uh, and games games like on this campus, those are those are fun. Our schools um, that recognize um, their esports program and support it with a combination or just one of time, space, leadership, and uh, funds, um, there are currently uh, 48 varsity programs. A number have announced within the last week, and a number more uh, are going to announce in the coming weeks and months. One of those I'll, I'll uh, preview here for just uh, in just a moment. But those are varsity programs, right? Those are the ones who say, this is a thing that we do, and we're going to support it. Now, they... They, and maybe this is more than you asked, but they exist in three different places. They're not just tied to athletics. In fact, right now, oh, about 35 to 40 percent are tied to athletics. Um, another percentage of them tied to student affairs, right? As part of a club sport that then gets elevated into a varsity sport, but still in student affairs or student life. And the remainder are uh, tied to uh, academic departments, uh, my university. In fact, all four of the FBS schools uh, that have varsity esports programs are are tied to academic departments. Uh, some associated with computer science or game design, others like ours, education. 
but uh, Utah, Boise State, Miami University, and uh, Georgia State all have varsity programs tied to academic departments. Okay, next rapid fire question. Oh, cool. Okay, so uh, what supports do esports athletes at varsity programs have? Do they get scholarships? Do they get um, you know money, support, tutoring? That, you know, yeah, there's the so range many. Of that. From no scholarships that, yeah, to five hundred a semester, really? to, okay. uh, to full scholarships in, in a couple of the Robert Morris, um, um, uh, students get full uh, scholarships, uh, and uh, many are trying to build to that so that they can remain competitive in the best folks. Some get it's all dramatically different. It's all dramatically different. There's no regulation, and there won't be any regulation. Anything to add to that? Cool. Anything to add to that? Oh, fun one. Well, this is a fun one. No, it goes to everyone. Um, what games do you guys play? I'll turn that over to y'all's, and then I'll come off the top rope. You can start. <laughs> I know the answer to yours. Okay, so <laughs> I I literally only play League of Legends, but a specific game mode called Arams. <laughs> so this game mode um, is less serious and less competitive, and I like it because people don't really care if you mess up, and the community is generally just more wholesome, I guess. And that's it's really fun. Yeah. I mean, uh, Jinx. Yeah. Um, what, do, what do you say? Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just kind of, I play, I'm a social player, I, but also, like, in games that I, my main games, like League or Fortnite and stuff like that, I like to grind and uh, climb ranks and stuff. Um, <clears throat> but I play anything from League of Legends, Witcher 3, Fortnite, Hearthstone, just everything. Um, and I like playing with friends and people in the community around our club and stuff. It's, it's just fun. Scion support. <laughs> should play sometime. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I feel. Um, uh, let's see. I think that's, yeah, that's Chris's list right there. That's right. Hey, I'll silver key with you guys all day. Right. Hey, I'll silver key with you. Silver for life. Hey, hey, but we're all diamond at heart, Look, right? If I can just get a good streak going, I could be diamond. I have uh, just two more. Um, so um, Cal is asking, he has two questions. One is, uh, how do singer play player games factor into esports? Is there a space for that? Also, how does money play into esports? Like there's certain games where you kind of have to buy in. Um, you know, Hearthstone, yep. Heath, Heart, like, sorry, for, yeah, Hearthstone, you know, where money comes to play. How does this work? How do we... Well, if you, uh, if you have a var varsity uh, Hearthstone team, uh, team uh, and, or you're a director of a program with the varsity Hearthstone team, expect emails every day saying, I need more decks, you know, can you please give me more decks and things like that. Yes, you need, you need some decks. You want to add something to that? Um, regarding Hearthstone, so in my experience, we actually had uh, Hearthstone. 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 Um, uh, we had a player come in last year that was on our uh, D1 team, essentially, that they transfer, they're a transfer student from China, and so the regional account doesn't transfer, so they don't have any of their cards or anything. And they essentially didn't buy anything and were free to play grinding up and they still reached legend which is the highest ranks in hearthstone through a very uh a basic deck of cards if you play hearthstone it's called zoo you'd be familiar um but it just kind of shows that there is a degree of skill that in hearthstone that doesn't require the monetary investment so uh that's just one case. Right. That and, I have and Hearthstone, which is a single player though. game, although the way that Collegiate works, it's actually a three player game, one playing, two advising in the Collegiate uh, realm. But that's not the only one. StarCraft is also being played collegiately, which is also a, a single player game. Uh, so, but again, those, those communities, it's not girls playing girls, boys playing boys, it's just everybody. And that's what's cool about uh, esports. One of the reasons that uh, organizations like the NCAA don't quite know how to handle it because everything else has been so segregated. Um, it's it's a natural 
comfortable cultural coexistence in most of these games. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty dang cool. Did we answer all those questions? Yeah, you did, and I have one more. Um, so this asks, uh, Alice is asking, are the people active in esports at UNC at least, do they come from all academic majors? Are there certain majors that are more prevalent? Like, you know, where are they coming from? <laughs> so definitely the most prevalent major has to be computer science, um, but everyone does come from everywhere because gaming is, it's, it's something that is available to most everybody. And I think one thing that, uh, one reason for our most, uh, most of our members being computer science is just that we are student organization stems from the computer science department uh, here on campus. So we just naturally have that uh, outlet and it's easier to work within that uh, circle of uh, people, I suppose. I have a just talk there. Um, hi, this is Lisa, <laughs> I have a question. You had an amazing simulation of the plans for your new battle arena at mm -hmm. Boise State. Are you? Did you upload that file? Are you able I, I to share that show audience? That file or I, I can, can either, either show you that file, which I think really does a better job of the emotional. Yeah. All right, I'll, we'll do it your way. We'll do it your way. Um, all right. Well, one vote for dance, but uh, but not nearly enough. So let me show you this space. The video has ended. Um, I just knocked it. There we go. All right. So uh, we'll pull this up and, and try to play it. In, uh, it no, no audio. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to give you this one. I think because it's going to stream from my computer may, may delay just a little bit. So let me just show you a little bit of the space. I'll try to get it paused in, in the right moments here. But one of the things that I think is critical to the vision of esports is for people to um, – to make connections to other sports that they know. So if they don't know this, they know that this belongs with the thing that they know. And this is a space that does it. Actually, Lisa and I talked about this last night. We did, we did a very strange thing. We did a launch party, which I can share with you in a moment, um, that where we brought, uh, created two teams and we did our own orange versus blue League of Legends game on a stage, amazing digital wall behind us. And it was really super cool. Um, but at the door, we did a bag check, right? People come in, you have a security card, kind of look through their bag, just make sure there's nothing that they shouldn't be carrying in there. We didn't think that people were going to try to bring in a lot of contraband, but what other events have a bag check? Football, basketball, right? Big, big sports. They have, a, they have a bag check. This is the space that we've designed, which is, uh, is in the process of being built, will be available spring of 18. This is our esports battleground. Twitch Studio and Arena, sponsored by big names who want to be a part of, uh, of this space. Students come in and check in like they would a cyber cafe. They can choose any of the, uh, the spaces that they, that they want. They can sit next to their friends. They can even uh, swing over and play console games if they want, because console games are a big part of it, uh, Smash Forever. Um, using uh, basically an integrated internet cafe, they can log in, they can pay for some hours, you know, three bucks an hour kind of a deal. To students, that's not a lot of money. Let's say anybody, that's not a lot of money just to come and sit and play and hang out. Um, it means anybody in the community can come in as well. It's not just for students. We attract people to our campus. Um, we also, of course, since we're competitive, building out a team room, uh, which allows for, uh, for students to come in, be, uh, be coached, practice, and compete together. And, of course, a, an integrated Twitch studio that can look out onto any of those spaces. And then, of course, a 200 seat flat floor uh, uh, competitive arena that can be used for lots of different things. And this space is the space that we've designed um, using existing space that we have. And by my count, it's just nine walls, right? Nine, actually, if we count the back wall, it's already there, right? So it's just a matter of creating these spaces that will attract people for multiple purposes, creating a uh, creating an environment where people can come and watch esports because that's what we want to do. Now, we do watch it on Twitch and, and other places, but, um, but there's, a, there's a different characteristic when we're in the, in the same room cheering for one another. It's really exciting. It's as exciting uh, as, a, as a football game or, I dare say, on this campus, a basketball game. But uh, 
Is that, is that kind of what you're looking for, Lisa? Okay. Good then. Other questions that we might have. Enrique says, UNC, get on it. Okay. Noted. We've got that. Has a question for him, Chris? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have two questions. One, um, what were you previously oh. in space before you repurposed it? Library. Good question. Second floor. Library. And second, was there a lot of pushback? Second, was there a lot of pushback when you tried to reclaim that space? Or was it just not being Currently, used at all? <clears throat> excuse me. It's a bunch of stacks. Um, bunch of those stacks. stacks are being moved and retired, consolidated, you know, things like that. So while it was library space, and some people are always protective of library space because what they, did I say library or library? That, forgive me if I said library. Library space. Um, those, you know, historically we protect those things because they, they mean literature. They mean, this is not what that was used for. Lots of magazine bindings and, and things like that. So not a lot of pushback. Um, a lot of excitement, really, about, oh, wow, that, this would be great to use this space. Your second question? Oh, okay. Oh, I thought the next one was, do I lift? A little, you know, mostly <laughs> leg days tomorrow. But, um, are there other questions? Um, are there other questions? To that? Um, I, I, you know, as we kind of wrap up, kind of get close to the end here, I want to show you something, and then I think we can kind of answer some questions on the way out. Does that work? Okay. So I'm a big believer, and I'm just going to show you this video. I'm a big believer that... Um, that the facts to support esports are all here. And as we learn these facts and we memorize these facts, um, we often jump in with the idea that, um, that that's what we have to lead the discussion with because the facts will equal motion, right? That everybody will see it the same way we see it, but that's, that's usually not the case. The emotional message is what wins the day. Now, if the facts support, the emotional message, then we get behind it. But we we want to know, I think, how we should feel about something. And I think it's critical on us when we're trying to get major change on a campus, and I've done this on my campus, to make sure that I prepare things in a way that, uh, sorry, this is a terrible monologue before I show a video, but um, that, I, that I make sure that the emotional message that, that I have is deliberate and that it's communicated. So what I'm going to show you is just one of the many videos that, uh, that we use um, to show what happened in an event. Because our university president, many of our student body and, and faculty and fans, they don't get to go with us. They just Maybe they saw the news bit that we beat Colorado State, but they don't really get it. So I think it's important for us to make sure that we're, we're sharing not just the message of what happened, but how it felt to be there. And so this is an example of some of the media that we create to share that experience with people. So this was DreamHack, it was last weekend, and it was Boise State on the main stage versus Colorado State. And you'll notice um, featured prominently in here is uh, Maggie Borland, who is our uh, Overwatch team captain. She's a grandmaster, uh, Mercy and Sombra player. She's amazing, she's a great leader. The fact that she's female doesn't even phase her teammates. She's just OP Maggie, she's just super strong. All right, here's the video. While we're in overtime, it looks like Colorado State has what they need to pull this out, but Boise State here is not going to give up very much.
And so that is, that's part of the message design that gets people bought in. They, they may not understand what happened. They, they may not know that this payload was stopped at 0 0.06 meters from the score. And because of it, we won the map. That's where the game turned. And then we, we blanked them from that point on, won three straight. And that was the moment where it happened. They may not get that because they're not into the game as much yet. But you know what? That's the same with football, isn't it? Right. Mom may not understand why, um, you know, NC won, but they she yeah. does know that it was exciting she and that somebody did that something special and, and that somebody loved being part of that tribe that, that had that win over Miami. Right. And we're super excited. Oh, by the way, I've, I've had a premonition about tomorrow. Things are looking good. Just gonna say. So. So yeah, um, I, I, it's a cool place to be. Yeah, cool, cool, I, I, cool to talk cool about. Cool place to be. Cool, cool things to talk about. Thoughts. Lisa, I know we got to be. Lisa, I know we got to be cautious of time, but you want to. I'm um, just thrilled. I'm here at UNC and in the School of Ed. We're exploring. Um, that was the purpose of inviting you here. Highly um, supportive of esports. I'm a gamer myself and um, love what's going on in the club. Any way that we can help you or help make connections, we'd love to support that process in any way that we can. Um, and so moving forward, there may be people in this webinar that wanna contact you guys. One thing that we do ask is if you're open to that, would you mind typing your email address um, in the chat so people can reach out to you now or in the future? We do keep these webinar recordings. We upload them to our YouTube channel. Um, and if you guys have a YouTube channel, we're happy to share the recording with you as well. Um, so you can share it with your audience. Any final, I'm just really excited about the potential. Chris, thank you so much. I'm looking at you and not at the camera, but thank you so much for being here today um, and sharing with us the really exciting news of what's going on at Boise State. Um, I love hearing about what's happening with you guys at, here at UNC. Um, and just looking forward to kind of how things unfold. Oh, um, I think you guys should make an announcement. You have Game Fest going on um, this oh, yeah. weekend and starting tonight at six o'clock. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah. Uh, so actually tonight is going to be a casual LAN uh, over at Citizen Hall. And it's just going to be all our games in the computer science building. Um, Tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be awesome. We're going to have a bunch of tournaments going on, and, um, including our biggest would be League of Legends. It's going to be Overwatch, Hearthstone, mm -hmm. and um, like Rocket League, all the cool games. Dota 2, if you're into Dota that. Two. Also, we're going to be um, having Smash. giveaways <laughs> and drawings for Microsoft VR. Will be a Microsoft nothing. VR and then Ubisoft is going to have the Assassin's Creed Origins demo and it's going to be huge. And we're also going to have a DX racer um, for a drawing. 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 <laughs> and then that's one package. And then the other one is going to be a Rockcast gaming mouse and keyboard. And you guys should definitely come out. We, we will have food. We will have food. I have a question. Um, is, is your event open to faculty and staff? Mm -hmm. Our event is open, it's for open to anyone. And can we compete for prizes? You can. Yes. yes. So the thing <laughs> about it being open to everyone, however, is that um, preferably not under 18, because technically we can't have, we have to have a, a bunch, like everyone at the event sign off a waiver and stuff like right. that. Um, but yeah, just a wink, not that many under 18. <laughs> they would have found this webinar. Maybe, maybe they did. Cool. <laughs> no, he's open now. All right. Um, are there any final comments? Questions from, from the peanut gallery. Questions from, from, the, questions from the audience. So, um, if nobody else has questions. So, you, you showed us now where Boise is now, and then uh, your future is to build this mm -hmm. so, gaming arena. Mm -hmm. So, what, what's the plan? Global domination. Now? Um, we think it's, um, we've got to have our space so that we can do our thing our and attract other people to come do stuff for us. That's, that's the big part of it. There are already that's, programs that's that, are, that are feeding into these things um, and interested. We've got a, a, a massive games, interactive media and mobile uh, program part of the college of innovation, uh, program, innovation and design their way into we want to be able to teach teachers how to build these in their spaces 
Um, this is one of those gold rush moments um, in, in the birth of a new idea. And the people, especially in education, who established those things, um, we spoke about football and where it came from. The second part of that story, which you're allowing me to pay off now, which I would have forgot about otherwise, is that Notre Dame, one of the strongest football programs, joined in the 15th year of college football. It was 1884. Uh, and they were the 18th team to join. Now, Notre Dame, of course, came in with only 18 teams and just dominated, right? No. It would take them 36 years to win their first national championship. A richer, bigger, more influential school. 36 years. And in that time, Princeton, one of the first, won 15. Yale, one of the first, won 17. Rutgers, I'm sorry, I don't know what, I don't know what happened. So maybe it's the Rut Rutgers curse. But being early, being big, supporting at the right time, there's urgency, right? There's urgency. So you ask the question, what do we want in, in 10 years? We want a fully robust program that not just plays games and gives a space for people to come and play games and socialize and do those things. But, uh, but a full, a full integration into broadcasting and into teaching. Um, we believe that, uh, that there will be an Olympian from Boise state in the 2020 and the 2024 Olympics as an esports athlete. We believe we'll have one of those folks. So that's part of our plan, right? How do we, how do we make sure that we get those folks in? How do we prepare them in a way that they can qualify for those things? So, um, it's it's big vision. It has to be big vision all the time. Um, I think most of us would be satisfied if we could take over a room about this size and just put machines in it, right? But that's step one. We always have to think beyond that target, I believe, if we're going to reach that target, right? Because if you don't have enough momentum to get through your first goal, often you just never quite get to it, right? So it's about setting your sight on bigger things. And this just becomes one of the things in the way that that room is, to me is like a step one of of a big plan. Uh, eventually, maybe we have a, a, a building, you know, that's just dedicated to, to esports and things around esports. Um, something more like the Blizzard Arena with 450 seats, stadium seating, massive monitors, you know. I got to see that uh, a few weeks ago and it was on on the, on the So. Integrate integration with current yeah. stadiums. So it, in, to, uh, in April, we're going to do so some in in that, uh, championships. Again, uh, so I'm going to use the word here, and it'll make sense to some of the older folks in the room. That's that's not a dig. Um, but the idea of a moonshot, um, you, you, you have to aim for something huge, even though the, the pieces aren't in place. One of the things we're, we're announcing is that we're doing the Western States High School Video Game Championships. They're going to come to Boise State. We're going to play the final matches in Taco Bell Arena, which is a 13,000 seat stadium, right? We're going to play the final matches there and we're going to try to get two professional teams to come in and play as the, as the marquee event. Um, when you do that, you create this culture on campus that people get. It's the moonshot. It's like, well, yeah, we can do that. You know, it's, uh, we may not be the first to space, but we can be the first to a place no one's ever gone before. And that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're at the end of our time, um, and so I'm going to thank all of you online that have joined us today. Um, thank our special guests, um, Chris, Shane, Irene, and Hazim, um, and everybody in the audience. Thank you for coming. We're going to stop the webinar here. If the dialogue wants to continue in the room, we're certainly open to conversation. So bye, everybody online, and thank you so much for logging in today. Okay, so that's...